Well, good morning. <clears throat> if you are just joining us, we're live streaming our Easter service. This is my favorite Sunday of the year. I just love Easter. It's just so beautiful to gather and what we're going to celebrate. And I pray that you are filled with joy and peace in believing. While in the midst of very different circumstances this Easter, I'm praying uh, that, that we're doing all that we can as shepherds to keep leading you and guiding you into your blessed hope. So my joy is full, but boy, I, I do miss some things about today. And I think my favorite is those kids just running around in all their little Easter dresses. And the Drake family blessed me today with their three little ones, two, two little cute Easter dresses and an Easter suit. It was just beautiful. And all my little guys that have their Pastor Murphy suits that come and show me on Easter, I just love you guys and I'm thinking about you. Uh, my my all-time favorite, though, is at the close of the service when I declare that he is risen and just watching your glowing faces come back at me and say he is risen indeed. So at the end, I, I just want you to open your windows and I want you to yell as loud as you can and maybe I can hear it here at the church. So let's yell that out and be prepared at the end of this service. So a special welcome to any of our guests who are joining us here this morning. I am glad you are with us, and I wish I could meet you personally, and maybe when we get this lifted, we could gather together uh, and break bread. So I'm going to preach uh, a sermon on the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that means to us in 2020. And I want to tell you this, it, it means a lot. It's the most significant truth in all of the world People spending hours reading about this coronavirus that can only kill. And I'm going to give you a message that can give life. It can give you eternal, abundant life. Life that nothing can take away. Life or death or any other created thing will never be able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So this, this hope uh, I want to give to you this morning in some hopeless times. It's been said that a human can live only 40 to 50 days without food, three days without water on average, three minutes without air, but we can only live a few seconds without hope. Hope is a difficult thing in the middle of a pandemic. And some of you are locked up and alone or maybe with family and you're just feeling so alone. And I know there's some of you who are more prone to depression and it's just such a hard time. And so I want to encourage you to, to reach out, to text us, to call. Keep reaching out. We, we want to help each other through this time. And this is a very, very difficult time on the battle with depression. Some of you have taken financial hits. You've got loved ones who are sick, and you've even had to bury some loved ones. And there are differing views of how much this will affect our global or national economy whether we'll have jobs and rent house, rent, house payments, food. Hope is not at a premium at this point. And so I want to preach this morning on a message of hope because hope in the Bible, what I love about biblical hope, it's not something that you wish for that might happen. It's not, I hope this virus lifts. I hope I can get back to work. This is absolute certainty. God's hope is this is what I will do and you can bank everything on it. It's absolutely certain, no doubt about it. When Jesus was raised from the dead, it was stamped, no doubt about salvation in him alone. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. Last year in 1 Peter, we looked at the resurrection of Jesus Christ and he gave us a living hope. And it's seated at that time. I stated at that time that all other hopes are dead hopes or dying hopes. As we sit here this morning with some of those hopes are no longer dying, they're dead. And the question is, what am I going to hope in as some of my other hopes are being taken away? What's my hope? Things are going to get better. They always do. Is that your hope? A little religion. I need some hope for this life. I just need it easier and a little better. Come to Jesus and your life will be easier. It's a lie. Mine's been harder. Paul says in our chapter this morning, if we hope in Jesus only in this life, we're most men to be pitied. So then what is the living hope? What is the hope that's virus-proof, recession-proof, and tragedy-proof? 
Is there a hope that is absolutely certain and can sustain us through our whole lives and pass this life into eternity? Because what is the one thing that always comes and steals our hope? It's that enemy called death. Death is the enemy of hope. You can save your whole life so you can retire and travel with your spouse. And you finally get there and she dies of cancer. It sits on us our whole life. Hebrews says it's a a fear that enslaved us all of our days. It was always in our head. A virus comes and most begin to to fear because this could get me quick. This could come real quick now. There's not a waiting period. Every time you find a new lump or a mole or you attend a funeral, that enemy of death is whispering in your ear saying, this is an enemy. What am I going to do about death? One of our presidents of the United States said that it is irrational to die without fear. Why? When I think of annihilationism, you just go away when you die. But when death comes, here's what you're afraid of. I can't be totally sure of that view. My fear is that maybe it's not annihilationism. (laughs) Nobody can know for certain. And there's still a little fear in the back of my mind. I could be wrong. Conscience makes cowards of us all of something after death. Because we all know we failed. We know there's a judge. Is there any hope for us in light of this? It scares us. It's irrational not to be afraid of death. It's such a enemy. Just death takes away all of our hopes. And psychologists tell us that you you can't repress it or you're going to have great consequences if that's what you do. So what do we do with death? Well, our nation likes to glamorize it and say it's just a natural part of life. It's a peaceful cessation. There's just nothing to fear. It's actually your friend. I can't hear you. Woo, I don't want to deal with you, death. But in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, it says the last enemy that Jesus will abolish is death. It's an enemy. (laughs) If from human motives, Paul says, I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus. What does it profit me in verse 32? If the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. There isn't a a resurrection and we don't stand before God. Let's just have a party and live it up. But because there there is a judgment at the end, we better deal with it. And we love to change the channel. And even this morning, I got up for an Easter message and some guy's talking to me about my greatest fear. I'm going to change the channel. Or what do you do today? You go to a different live stream. I don't even know what you do. You're going to change right now. I'm going to ask you to sit in this this morning and look at this. Because there is a remedy for death. Don't run away because it's uncomfortable. Doesn't work. That's never going to produce what we're going to look at this morning. Paul's going to look at death. He's going to laugh at it. He's going to defy it. He almost mocks it. Where, oh, death is your victory. Where, oh, death is your sting. (laughs) What I want to do this morning in 30 minutes is I want to give you an answer to your fear of death. And I mean, take it away. And I want to give you amazing hope in this life and in the next. A hope that is immutable. It's not subject to change. So when things like this hit, pandemics, it can't can't be taken away. It can't be squelched out. True hope is certainty that you can bank all of your life in eternity upon what I'm going to share with you this morning. A hope that can anchor you every day in your life and give you purpose and joy. My friends, that is Easter. And so let's go to our God and pray that he will unfold Easter to our hearts this morning and accomplish taking away the fear of death and giving us a hope beyond the grave. Father, I come before you this morning. God, death is all around us. And we need this message more than ever. And I pray, God, that you will take these words now and you'll multiply them to every heart that is listening here this morning. God, I pray that you will just infuse by your spirit and truth hope 
into every heart and that you will take the fear of death, God, and you will just say, be gone. You'll take it away and you'll fill it where it can even become a friend. Oh God, there's nothing in this world that can do it. We've tried everything. And so may everyone listening this morning look at your remedy for death and hope. God, I pray, do what no human being can do now in the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58. Paul's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's put in a tomb on the third day. He's raised, stamped across the whole uh, sky and blood. It's finished, accepted. He's accomplished the salvation that I wanted. Guaranteeing now that anyone who's connected to Jesus in faith will have a resurrection to life as well. As certain as he is right now, see at the right hand of God. Those who are joined to him in faith, it's as certain that you will join him there one day. It's a certain hope. And I wish we had time to go through the whole chapter, but I'm not going to be able to do that this morning. And so we'll take up a couple of his closing statements and arguments from this chapter. And I want to give you an outline to work through with me as we journey verses 50 through 58. Here's your outline. Paul gives us four reasons why we can have hope this morning. Full, abundant, robust, trustworthy, unchanging, eternal hope. And in verses 50 through 54, we're going to look at our expectation that we can have. Then in verse 55, our encouragement. Verses 56 through 57, an explanation of how. And then I'm going to close with an exhortation in verse 58. So you give me enough time, I can come up with four E's and get you these beautiful outlines. All right. First, our expectation. Look with me in verse 50. Now I say this, brethren. That flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And so our, our final resting place called the kingdom of God, when God comes back and he'll renew this earth and take away its curse and all things will be beautiful, beautiful with God dwelling on it and people who have been made perfect dwelling together in perfect love with him. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And the bodies that we have now, I want you to hear this, they don't work, they don't fit with what God has laid up for us for what's coming. The perishable, these bodies that are perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. And so God's going to give us perfected, glorified bodies when he glorifies this world and makes everything perfect. I need a new body. And so these bodies are tattered and worn They just get sick and weary, decaying. We need glasses and our teeth give out and hearing aids, my digestion, pain, disease. They won't work with eternity in the presence of glory. God and all of his majesty, we need something better, perfected, that's that's imperishable, that won't wear out. It's going to be eternal. And so I need eternal energy. I need to not decay or degenerate for all of eternity. I need cells that don't go crazy and do cancer. I need a, a body that fits with eternity with God. And this is so cool in this chapter Paul says we all have flesh. There's there's certain kinds of flesh. There's the flesh of men and the flesh of beasts and birds and fish. Look with me in verse 40. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. In verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It's sown a perishable body and it's raised an imperishable body. It's sown in dishonor, and it's raised in glory. And it's sown in weakness, and it's raised in power. It is sown a natural body, and it's raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. And so Paul says it's like sowing a seed. A seed has to die. And as it's planted in the ground, what grows up is the glory of that seed. 
So when you put a little seed in, in the ground and a flower bursts out, or in this context, he says wheat. Wheat comes out of death. It, it, it's glorious. That, 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 that seed has to die to give birth to this imperishable, the beauty of what's going to come. And Paul says, same way with our bodies. You're going to die, and the trumpet's going to sound on the last day of history. And your eternal soul will be joined with this new resurrection body that's going to come up. And that will be glorious to dwell in the glory with God on this perfect and redeemed, beautiful earth forever. What an expectation. Verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We're not all going to sleep and that's death. But we're all going to be changed whether we die or whether we're alive when Christ comes back. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will all be changed. <clears throat> so not all are going to sleep being dead, but all are going to be changed at the second coming of Christ. There are going to be some Christians who have died and some who have not died. And then there's a mystery that both are going to be changed. And these decomposed bodies are going to be raised imperishable and joined with your eternal perfected soul. And then those who are alive, maybe in the prime with healthy bodies, you're going to be changed into your eternal body and state as well. And it's just going to do it uh, in the twinkling of an eye. It's not going to be a process. Your earthly body was born and it had to mature and grow up. But this one is instantaneous. It's going to just be God's going to blow that trumpet and you're going to be raised imperishable instantaneously. In verse 53, then this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. And so two things are going to change. The perishable will, not put, on the, will put on the imperishable and you're no longer going to be decaying and wearing out and weakening with these bodies. And mortal is that which dies. And you're going to put on immortality. And, and, and so you're, going to, you're, you're, you're never going to die in these new bodies. In heaven, it says death is going to be done with. It won't even be a term anymore for all of eternity that we'll ever have to think about. These bodies will no longer die. This mortality must put on immortality. Both are going to change with our resurrection bodies, the perishable and the mortal. And we'll put on imperishable and we'll put on immortality. What's that going to look like, you ask? I don't know. I don't know. There, there's a chance that I might be handsome. I've been praying. Uh, I, I just don't know, but I know this, guys. They're going to be amazing. And they're going to have a, an ability to receive the fullness of God and all of His beauty and majesty and you're going to be able to handle it and not disintegrate like anyone who saw the glory of God died. And so we're going to have bodies that are going to be able to be in his very presence and not be like a chip in the middle of the noonday sun. And we're going to stand in his blazing glory in these bodies. It's going to be different for sure. And it's going to be similar as well because they recognize Jesus in his resurrected body. He comes and he eats fish and then he goes through a wall like a ghost. I don't know perfectly, but I know we'll be perfect. And that is our hope of resurrection. Isn't that great <laughs> for those whose bodies are wearing out, even in our midst? Cancer, and we got kidneys, and autoimmune issues, and allergies, and weakness, and sickness, and COVID-19. This is the hope for these perishable bodies that are wasting away in a toxic-filled world. It's not to spend billions of dollars on how to keep them from perishing. That's a battle that you will lose. These bodies are perishable, and we have this hope of resurrection. And I think the most futile thing that I've ever seen is giving your life to not have these bodies perishable. Bodybuilding, eating right, pulling skin back, tucking things in. It's just perishable. Do you want a better hope this morning than body beautiful? This is my hope for body beautiful. If you could see what I'm going to look like, uh, C.S. Lewis said, you might be tempted to worship me. I'm so fired up. Do you realize what you're going to get? 
This has been going through my mind this whole week. A little virus turns the whole world upside down. It's destroying and killing perishable bodies. And my hope is not a cure for it, but I want the cure. I can Netflix binge and social media and jog and do music, or I can sit and think and think. Everything in me is dying and decaying. If this doesn't get me, something else will. I wasn't made for this. I've been built for a realm where everything gets sweeter and sweeter and newer and newer and better and better and fresher and fresher, and every day is better than the last. That's what I've been made for. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal dying life also. The body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. What an expectation, people of God. And this might be so warped, but I love gravesides. I love them because every time I look at that casket by its grave and I'm doing a believer's graveside, I know the trumpet's going to sound and those bodies are going to be raised and perishable. And they're going to be joined with that perfected soul to dwell with God forever. He says, comfort one another with these truths and these words. That's our expectation. Pretty beautiful. Now I want to look at our encouragement this day. Look with me in verse 54c. And then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? When this happens, at the trumpet sound, all is going to be changed. And then we'll come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Quotes from Isaiah 25, 8 and Hosea 13, 14. I wish I had time to unpack those. But what I want you to hear this morning is here's our great enemy. The one that ruins all of our fun and all of our enjoyment. It breaks relationships. It hurts our quiet times and it, it quenches our dreams and our hopes and our retirements. The last enemy it's called. It is an enemy. And don't try to make it docile and tame it. What is going on here? Paul is standing up defiantly to death. The one that before this, everyone's lost. Everyone's lost the battle with death, but Jesus Christ. And Paul is now standing and he's looking it down. He's opposing it. When I grew up, there was this guy called James West, Wild Wild West, Robert Conrad. And there was a commercial where he took a battery and he put it on his shoulder and said, I dare you to knock it off. I see Paul just putting death on his shoulder going, come on, death, here's my life. I dare you to knock this off. It's like a mic drop. Boom. Where's your victory? Where's your sting? We got to take a look at this. This is just startling and beautiful. No one talks to death like that. Death is swallowed up in victory. I heard this example and I like it. But there's a piece of pie on your table. There's two ways to get rid of it. Throw it away, put it in the fridge or something, or eat it, which has been the history of my quarantine time. To get rid of it, you can swallow it, and it's gone. Death is an enemy in verse 26. When we get cancer or sick or weaken, we lay in our deathbed and we breathe our last and we die. It sure feels like an enemy to me. It's been hurting me like crazy the last couple weeks. It feels like it won. Like it got the last word. The soul that sins must die. And yet Paul is telling us, no, no, it's been swallowed up. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And so we looked at the cross Friday night. And Jesus breathed his last with a horrible, torturous death, bearing the wrath of God being mocked throughout. He's put in a grave of Joseph of Arimathea. All hope is lost. It's gone. Everyone goes home. The whole earth goes dark. 
Did death get a victory over him? Yes, the devil, Judas, Herod, Pilate, the Jewish leaders, we got rid of them. But three days later in this morning, what we celebrate is they came to the tomb and Jesus had risen just as he said. He went right into death and he defeated it. He took the jaws out of it, the sting. Life came forth, the eternal life was raised. He rose from the dead, he rose the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. I want you to hear this. His death was the death of death. It was not a defeat. It's the heart of our victory. And he took our sin and our death and he swallowed it up. My sins, though they were many, his mercy is more. And I want you to hear this. We can now stare death in the face and say, oh, death, where's your victory? Where's your sting? My best friend with bone cancer from seminary, this was the last sermon he preached on this earth. Where's your sting? So cool. The Greek word is not a a bumblebee. You get stung and you put a little baking soda or essential oils on it. It's used in Revelation of a deadly scorpion that was absolutely lethal. And so I want you to think about this. It's not the bite of the scorpion that can hurt you so much, but the poison that was excreted into the wound. And so there was a poison that would lead to death. And now there was a a poison in death because of Adam, that that sin entered the world, so, so came death. And now there's a second death. You die on this earth, and there's a second death for those separated from Jesus called eternal wrath. Jesus said, don't fear him who can kill only your body, but fear him who can kill both body and soul in Gehenna, which is hell. Guys, there's a second death. Jesus talked more about it than heaven. There's a second death, and that's the sting. The sting of death has lost its sting for the believer. Death has lost its death. The death of death is gone. Yes, a poke happens. It happened this week. It hurts. But there's no poison in it anymore. There's no poison for genie. Where, oh death, is your victory? Where, oh death, is your sting? Gone. So much so that Paul and Jesus now call it sleep. When you die, it, it, your body's put in a grave and it says, You're sleeping. You're just asleep. Where's the sting in that? You're asleep. And when you see someone sleeping, what do you expect? That They're going to wake up and that body's going to rise again and walk and eat. And so now it's a body at sleep, at peace. And I want to tell you something, even more than that. Paul says it's it's no longer an enemy. It's sleep, but it's also our friend. To die is gain. Death now is my chariot ride into my eternal blessings with Christ forever. Paul said to die is very much better than to stay on this earth. Jesus didn't just take away an enemy. He made it your friend. The sting is gone for the believer in Christ. And I want you to hear this. I can stare it in the face and not explain it away, not try to make it beautiful. I can defy it. And I can give my life in a coronavirus to serve others. And I can go to Tijuana with my family. Or we got a lady in our church praying about going to New York on the front lines to share the gospel with those who are dying. Who, who does dumb things like that? <laughs> People who believe this gospel. And the sting of death is gone and it's been swallowed up in victory. And they have no fear of death. But they have fear for those who die and might have the second death and they're willing to give up their lives for death in this body so that those would never experience the second death. And I tell you with all my heart, I pray there's no one in here listening who will have a second death. Jesus was raised from the dead 
to give you eternal life. Jesus said to Martha, you shall live even if you die. There's a poke, but there's no sting. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies. I have something for the coronavirus. And it's better than any cure I've read about on CNN or in articles. <laughs> it's in this Christ whose tomb is empty. So our expectation is an amazing glorified body. And our encouragement is we can look death now in the face. And now we got to explain that. We need an explanation for why that could be. So I want you to come to verse 56 with me. The sting of death is sin. and The power of sin is law. The sting of death is sin. And so what made death a sting was sin. The soul that sins must die, said God. He said in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. No one is exempt. Deep down, everybody knows it. We're guilty. And you spend your whole life trying to prove you're not. You help with Girl Scouts and you help old ladies with their groceries. You're doing wonderful things during the coronavirus because you're trying to make yourself not feel guilty. But before a good, holy, just God who demands perfection, we are all guilty. And you know it. And we know there's a day of reckoning. We try to explain it with false things. But I, anytime I've seen anyone dying, they recognize it. And we try to ignore it and put it off. And we say, hey, man, just enjoy the ride. And I was just thinking about it this week. If you jump out of the pl uh, plane and one of you has a parachute and one of you doesn't, one of you are going to enjoy the ride a lot different. We've got to find a better way to deal with death and just enjoy the ride. Get, get as much gusto as you can while you're here. That's a bad remedy. And so you got to do one of two things if we're going to deal with this rightly. You can suppress God and say, oh, it, we're just evolved. He doesn't exist. There's no God. Uh, and make him into some fashion of what you want him to be. Or you can change yourself and say, I I'm really not that bad. And spend your whole life trying to say, I'm a good person. I I'm really good. And, and so you can keep shuffling those things around, but they'll never deal with your real problem. We can suppress this by drugs, by work, by food, alcohol, Sex, video games, and the guilt just keeps coming. And when there's a chance of catching something that can kill you, quarantine can be really, really bad for you and your mind. Death has a scorpion sting. There's a real death after death. There's a judgment and then eternal suffering. There's a sting is putting it way too lightly. The writer of Hebrews says it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. That's not a little sting. So get this. It's your sin that brings the sting of death. Sin is what puts the horror into death. A just God must punish sin. He's promised and he declared it. His character has to punish sin. There's a true sting to death without Jesus. And there's a day of accounting. And I just need you to get that. But listen further. In verse 56, and the power of sin is the law. The law that God gave in the Ten Commandments through Moses, if you ever saw the movie. What gives sin power to damn us? The law is how God wants us to live. He's the creator. He has the right to tell his creatures what is right and righteous. And all transgressions from it are punishable. The law gives us justifiable guilt before God. It gives a just sentence and eternal torment. Sin became sin because now it's against God and his revealed will. You're shaking your fist at God every day with sin. It makes sin exceedingly sinful because now it's against this beautiful, wonderful, amazing creator God who gave his son for a remedy for sin. 
This is what gives power to sin, the law. The law. Now it's transgression. And every transgression against God must be punished. That is what makes death awful. That's what gives it a sting of God's justice. It's horrific to die with sin and the breaking of God's law. And all the telling yourself, oh, it's natural, it's beautiful, don't be afraid is spiritual suicide. It's the most unloving thing that you could do to yourself. Just love yourself for a second. It's the most unloving thing. If I didn't warn you and tell you of a more excellent way to deal with death, sin, and the law. And I'm going to tell you that now. There's good news in verse 57. But thanks be to God. There's no other way to fix this. You don't hold the key. How does God fix this problem and take the sting out of death? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see the most beautiful thing that I've ever seen in my life. The law demanded righteousness. The law revealed the true character of God. Jesus said it's to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. God does not grade on a scale. It's not for the one who tries hard. It's not, I just hope my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. Perfect righteousness is demanded by the law. And I can't do it perfectly. And I tried and I tried and I tried. But thanks be to God who sent his son into this world to obey it. And Jesus stood on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Every bit of the righteousness that was required in the law, Jesus came to fulfill it in our place as if we did. And anyone who breaks the law, the law, there's a curse upon him. God's judgment, God's wrath for anyone who transgresses this law. And so there's, there's wrath and there's death and there's eternal death because of sin and breaking this law. That had to be satisfied. God's justice has to be met. He can't wink at sin. He can't ignore it. I want you to hear a few verses in Romans 5, 7. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us us. Isaiah 53, 700 years before this. But Jesus was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, his own thoughts, his own ways to get right with God. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him and God punished sin there on that cross. So much so that Paul says in Romans 8 now, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ who came and fulfilled the law and fulfilled its punishment that we deserved so that we could be forgiven and received and accepted and loved by God, and could take away the sting of death. The hope that I have, the expectation of a resurrection body, the encouragement that death is swallowed up, and there's no sting, and I can defy it, and I can welcome it as a friend, and the explanation is the love of God for what he did in Christ Jesus by sending his own son to do this for us. And he was stung on a cross, He was stung and it wasn't his sin, but ours. And the law made it so that our sin was spitting in the face of God. Justice had to be satisfied and the father did not spare his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. George Herbert said, death used to be an executioner and now it's a gardener. (laughs) Death plants me as a seed in the ground 
and I'll come up a glorious flower with a resurrected body. Death can only make you better now. Death is a dark door to an amazing banquet hall with God forever. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? One last point. An exhortation, how do we live in light of what I just shared? Therefore, and you know how much I love therefore, and this one I think I might love even more. Therefore, in light, in light of COVID-19, the moving nature of our economy and all the hurts that have come and will come, feeding my family, will I live on a street, will I die, I don't know any of those things. Therefore, Jesus has taken away the sting of death and he's made it where when I, my death day is my best day and it will bring me into this eternal blessing with him forever. Therefore then, what do we do when this hits? Be steadfast. Don't be moved away from the hope of this gospel. Don't be cowering in your rooms saying, what are we going to do? I'm scared. There's nothing that can touch you. There's nothing that can hurt you because there's no sting. Every fear I have, if I flush it out, it ends with death. I want you to be steadfast. The word means firm. Immovable, like a rock or a tree that's planted by water. This is, this is someone who you just can't be moved away from this hope. And so what we need right now in this time are people who believe this gospel and will not be moved away from it and are always abounding in the work of the Lord. That means a, a, a abundance or overflow. <laughs> Just let there be overflow in working for God and his kingdom. It says, because it, it'll never be in vain. Because there's a sting to death. And we're laboring and we're toiling so that their, their sting will be taken away because Jesus bore it on a cross. And so I want to be abounding right now and letting people know that there's a way to have the sting of death. The death of death can be removed by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ and calling upon him. So I want you steadfast, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. This isn't the time for self-preservation. It's the time to behold this gospel and be rocks and steadfast. Don't be moved away. Look at the beginning of this chapter. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you which you received and in which you stand. That's what you're steadfast in. That's what you're immovable. It's the first verse, last verse of the whole chapter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And our resurrection is the gospel. Be steadfast. Stand in it. Don't be moved away from your hope right now. By which also you are saved. What? If you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Hold it fast to the very end. That's the call of this gospel. That's our call right now, people, is we need each other to keep holding to this gospel and believing it and being immovable and steadfast. And we're burying loved ones and we're hurting and it's been the hardest season of my life. And this gospel gives hope. Hope. Oh, Jeannie Tiffany. The hope. The hope. We're going to bury some more of us. You might bury me. And we got hope that I defy death. It's my friend. It's gain. And therefore, I don't have to cower and hide. I'm going to be steadfast and immovable and abounding in the work of God during this time. I pray. That's for free. <laughs> we don't need a cure for corona. We need a cure for the sting of death. And that's what I offer to you this morning. There is one who was stung on a tree in your place. And he says, come to me. Come to me and I'll give you rest for your soul. 
And so quit running and looking to all the other things. Don't get a false hope in an antibody or, or zinc. <laughs> get hope that this tomb is empty. And death jaw was just snapped. And now that door is, is the door into the banquet hall of the wedding feast with Jesus Christ forever. Let's help each other hold to the very end and get this reward and not lose sight of what this resurrection tells us. And so normally there's 500 people sitting in here. And this morning you get to just sit in your living room. And so maybe you're free to cry. Maybe you're more free to deal with this. You don't have to put on a front. Just you and God and a resurrected son who offers you salvation. And you can keep pushing this away. And maybe tonight you start breathing a little deeper than normal and you got a temperature. What are you going to do? And I'm offering to you the true remedy. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That's the best news I've ever heard. And in light of that beautiful news, that our Savior has been raised from the dead and He's now Lord of Lord and King of Kings and He's conquered death, I declare unto you, He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Oh, I love you guys. Amen. God bless you, my dear brothers and sisters. And if you want this great salvation, there's a way through our website to reach out, text, whatever you need, we're here. And then for the saints of God, happy Easter. Enjoy celebrating the good news that cannot be taken away. It cannot be quarantined. Oh, guys, be glad for every debt that you ever had has been paid up in full by the grace of the Lord. Let's pray. Oh, Father, my heart is so warmed, so encouraged in these words. I pray, God, comfort our brothers and sisters who are suffering with loss of loved ones. God, comfort, prepare us, lift lift fear. Let your perfect love drive out fear from any heart this morning. God, what a blessed hope that we have. I love that that tomb is empty. I love that it preaches everything that Jesus said. It is finished, it's true. I thank you that now he's been raised for our justification. We can be right with you, oh God. Thank you for taking away the sting of death. Oh, the death of death. God, thank you that now it is the door to our banquet hall. God, our hearts rejoice and our hearts are full and glad. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we do pray these things. Amen.